Right, hi. So um, I'm here with um, Nick Watson, um, Specialist Registrar in General Surgery. We're going to talk about appendicitis. Um, thanks for coming today, Nick. Um, could you tell us uh, a little bit about how common appendicitis is? Well, it's, I think acute appendicitis has got to be the uh, number one uh, emergency surgical condition that as general surgeons we deal with really in, in patients of any age from childhood right through to uh, old age. Okay, and so patients often come in with, with appendicitis. What, um, what's the differential diagnosis? Sorry, um, what's, what's the history, classic history of appendicitis? Well, the things that we look for are really a short history, um, maybe two or three days at most of pain, which tends to start off centrally in the abdomen as a sort of visceral pain. Uh, then classically moving to the right iliac fossa and becoming more localised over time, uh, which is a result of local inflammation and irritation of the peritoneum around the appendix. Um, anorexia is a very prevalent feature over half of cases. It's quite Conversely, it's quite unusual to find someone who's got acute appendicitis who's still got a good appetite. Yeah, the McDonald's um, signs in kids. Yeah. Yeah. The... Um, Maybe a bit of nausea, vomiting can occur, but it's not, uh, you know, there are lots of different causes of vomiting. Occasionally a bit of diarrhea, especially if they've got a pelvic appendix uh, or a, a pelvic abscess as a result of perforated appendicitis, that can cause a bit of irritation of the yeah. rectum and, and diarrhea. Um, what, are, what, what sort of things in the history do you want to ask as well? I mean, particularly in women, I'm thinking. Well, You've got to consider all the all the differential diagnoses, and in, in women, the big differential is uh, sort of gynaecological causes of right iliac fossa pain, tubo ovarian pathology, so pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, ovarian cysts which can rupture or torsion of the ovary, uh, which gives very very severe sudden onset pain. So uh, a full gynaecological and menstrual history, whether they're sexually active, um, whether there's any chance they could be pregnant, which will look for later on anyway uh -huh. um, and also ask them about urological symptoms thinking about renal tract pathology on that side or even just a, an uncomplicated low urinary tract infection okay so we've got somebody who presents with central abdominal pain goes to right at fossa off their food a bit uh, what about on examination okay well we'd look generally to at the patient from the end of the bed do they look well or do they look unwell um, patients with the early stages of appendicitis can look relatively well because usually, or, or often, they're young, otherwise fit and healthy people. Mm -hmm. um, conversely, the patient with generalised peritonitis from a perforated appendix will look sick, pale, sweaty, not wanting to move due to pain, taking shallow breaths because it's painful for them to move their abdomen when they breathe deeply or cough or roll around in the bed. Um, they may or may not be uh, tachycardic. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you're looking to elicit signs of localised peritoneal. Yeah. So the other tachy guard is a, a fast pulse rate. They might have a bit of a temperature about 38, 38.5. Yeah, it's un it's unusual to see very very high temperatures mm -hmm. in appendicitis. Sort of 39.5, 40 plus is often something that you get with pyelonephritis and sort of yeah. urinary problems. Or in or in uh, or children, sort of cholangitis. And in ch in children, the big differentials mesenteric adenitis. Yeah. So non-specific viral illness causing yeah. localised enlargement of the lymph glands yeah. uh, inside the abdomen. They get a very high, that very high temperature okay. as well. So, and so you say about examining the abdomen mm. next? I, well, I normally, as I say, look look from the end of the bed and just see how the patient's holding themselves. And then uh, asking them to cough can be uh, quite informative. Actually, it's most informative if the patient is reluctant to cough or you know, won't cough because they know that uh, they anticipate that it's going to cause them pain. Yeah, so they cough, it moves the peritoneum um, and uh, where it's sore, so they'll cough and perhaps hold the right of that fossa if they've got appendicitis. Yeah. It's, it's just a bit kinder than sort of pressing pressing down hard on them. Yes. Um, the other sort of sensitive sign is percussion tenderness, which again is just as you'd percuss someone on the chest for resonance, yeah. just percussing gently uh, over the right iliac fossa, and if that elicits some reflex guarding contraction of the uh -huh. abdominal wall muscles, that's a sign of uh, localised 
peritoneal inflammation. Okay, so you have a gentle feel around the abdomen, perhaps uh, get them to cough and get them and percuss them right out of fossa. Yeah. And send there. So all those things with the history lead towards appendicitis. Any tests you'd do? Well, there, there is no specific diagnostic test to sort of rule in or out appendicitis. We use it as a clinical diagnosis um, primarily. It can be useful to do some tests to rule out other conditions. So, so definitely a urinary beta-HCG to make sure that the patient's not pregnant and it's not a ruptured ectopic mm -hmm. um, pregnancy that you're dealing with. Uh, urinalysis can be helpful. In men, we probably stop stop there well, without the, the beta-HCG. Yes, indeed. Um, in women... If there's if there's any doubt in your diagnosis, it can be useful to get a pelvic ultrasound scan. So that's a transvaginal ultrasound yes. scan to look at the ovaries and tubes yes. to look for those gynecological um, diagnoses okay. like ovarian cysts. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, I think I mean, the patient that we're dis sort of hypothetical patient we're discussing, uh, if they were male, presenting with yes. those symptoms and signs, that would be enough for me to. Um, I suppose the other thing is if it's a, a long repeated history just the back of your mind you've got to think about Crohn's disease perhaps as well. Yeah I and mean, we've not we've not really talked about other GI causes of right eye like fossa pain certainly the terminal ileum is most commonly affected part of the bowel with Crohn's disease um, the other possibility in older patients would be a right sided colorectal cancer and just occasionally they, those can perforate yes. um, and mimic appendicitis I've okay. certainly operated on that more than once but you those, those things, things are quite look uncommon. Sort of, they're quite uncommon. And you, yeah. and you, there would be something else about it that would be not quite sure. right. Usually. Okay. So you, you think they've got appendicitis. Mm. Uh, what do you do next? Well, in this day and age, more increasingly laparoscopic surgery. Yeah. You give them some analgesia and, uh, and resuscitate the patient. Well, yeah. yeah. So okay. We should, so we do that bit again. okay. So um, so you give them some analgesia, resuscitate the patient, then take them to theatre. And well, how would you approach appendicectomy? Yeah, well, in in this day and age, we're increasingly um, performing appendicectomies laparoscopically. Um, the evidence for who benefits from that, principally women, and that's because there's a broader range of differential diagnoses that you can spot laparoscopically. Uh, people who are in employment, because they tend to return to employment faster. People who are obese, it's easier. Um, to perform the surgery laparoscopically often rather than through a ver what can sometimes be a very large yeah. right eye net fossa incision um, and you know, the, the younger patient so the procedure itself is relatively straightforward yeah. you just pop okay. the laparoscope in as you would for, yeah. for any other procedure okay. and a couple of other <coughs> so, they, so you take the appendix out and go do that or open depending on expertise and um, most people get better quite quickly. Can you just tell us quickly what complications we might look out for? Okay, well, the, the commonest complications uh, if the patient's had appendicitis would be infective complications. Yeah. Uh, most frequently, infection actually within the wound, especially with open yeah. surgery. And what, you, what would you do, do to try and, try and prevent that? Uh, well, we give prophylactic antibiotics yeah. at the time of induction yeah. if they haven't had them already and so kefal yeah. and metronidazole yeah. and continued for a variable length of time post-operatively depending on how bad yeah. appendicitis is so if you've got a lot of pus then perhaps five days so it's either prophylaxis or treatment yeah yeah okay um so infection in the wound and then intra-abdominal infections mm -hmm. abscesses if they've had a bit of pus about um, and it's not been washed out fully. There's no evidence for use of prophylactic drains, um, but intra-abdominal abscesses can still occur, and they're perhaps slightly more common with laparoscopic surgery than with open surgery, mm -hmm. but that's up for debate. Okay, really. so, um, well, that's good, and they normally go home quite quickly uh, without any further problems, yeah. Okay, um, well, thank you for that, Nick. Okay, okay. not at all.